Hello students, this is Professor Sansom and I'm, we're going to talk today about chemical kinetics. And our experiment today is using spectroscopy again. And one of the things that I love about this is that we can use light to understand matter better. And a scripture related to this is from Genesis. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And one of the things that I appreciate about this scripture is that God uh, pauses for a minute and notices that what he's done is good. And I think that we can all learn a lesson from that, that sometimes we should pause and take a look at what we've done and uh, notice that it's good and notice the good things instead of dwelling on things that might be frustrating or negative. Okay, our experiment today is about kinetics. We're going to be using the spectrometers again and we're going to be using a variety of ways to find the order of a reaction with respect to a particular reactant. So we're going to use it doing uh, graphical analysis and also using rate data. And we're going to do this because we want to know what the rate limiting step is for this reaction. Our process skill for today is going to be critical thinking. And the reason that this is our process skill is because the whole goal of this experiment is to be able to make a claim about which step is rate limiting and provide evidence and analysis to support that claim. So um, thinking about how do you look at all the different information that you have and evaluate it and decide what's relevant for your argument. And then also in this case, because we're using these different methods to find the orders of reaction, you have to put them all together to be able to build the rate law. So a quick reminder about spectrophotometry or spectrometry, which is that we're going to use light. We're going to shine it on a sample and some of it might go through and some of it might not. So in this case, we have this red solution of I3 minus triiodide ions and that solution is red orange. And so the green and blue wavelengths of light won't make it through. They would be absorbed. The red and orange lights are making it through, those are transmitted, and the transmitted light is what reaches our eye. And in the spectrometer, we have our sample in the cuvette here. The light shines through, and then we're able to see which colors of light get absorbed or transmitted at the detector. This produces a spectrum that looks something like this, where we can see all the different wavelengths of light and which get absorbed and which are transmitted. In this experiment, the first half of the experiment, and this may scare you, but hopefully it doesn't, but the first, the first part of the experiment, you're going to just be finding the epsilon, the molar absorption coefficient for your substance, which you may recall is what you did in experiment one. But you guys are so much better at lab now, you'll surprise yourself with how quickly you're able to get this done um, and how much easier it is now that you're doing it the second time. So again, a reminder about Beer's law, absorbance equals epsilon C L. C is concentration, L is path length. Our path length is always one centimeter. And epsilon here is the molar absorption coefficient, which tells us how strongly the substance absorbs light at that wavelength. So in the first half of the experiment, you're gonna be using a variety of different concentrations, and you're going to use it to get your slope of this line, which is going to be your epsilon value. Just a note, when you type in the concentrations, on some people's computers, it will just show zero because it's a very small concentration. Um, but if you just type it in and then it turns into zero after you hit enter, it still has the value in there. It's just not showing it to you. So don't worry about that if that happens. Just type in the value and keep going. Um, so in part one, you're going to be varying the concentration here and uh, finding our epsilon. And once we have our epsilon, then we can find the concentration. Now in part one, these concentrations that you type into the software, you calculate them just by using the dilution equation. I have a concentration that's this much and I add this much water, what's my new concentration? M1V1 equals M2V2. Same thing that you've done before any time that you're making a dilution of a solution. But in part two, we can't do it the same way. And this is why we're doing part one. In part one, we get our epsilon. 
And now, if we know our epsilon from the slope of this line, then we don't need to know what the concentration is because we can find it based on the absorbance. And that matters because in part two, the concentration of our triiodide is going to be changing over time. And because it's changing over time, that's why we have to do part one so that we have a different way to find the concentration using our epsilon. And you'll notice the I3 minus is red, and as the reaction progresses, the red color is actually going to disappear. And so your solution at the end will be colorless. There are three possibilities here that we're going to look at for the order with respect to I3 minus, and we're going to use a graphical method to determine the order. The first option is zero order, and that's when absorbance versus time makes a straight line. The second option is first order, that's when the natural log of absorbance versus time makes a straight line. And the third option is second order, and that's when one over the absorbance versus time makes a straight line. And thankfully, in the software that you're using, you just click on the axis and it will switch between these. So you can decide which one makes a straight line pretty easily. And that's how you're going to find the order with respect to I3 minus. Once you've determined the order with respect to I3 minus, you're also going to do several trials where you vary the concentration of your acid and your cyclohexanone to find the order with respect to acid and cyclohexanone. So if I wanted to know the order with respect to HCl, which two trials would I use? And if I wanted to know with respect to cyclohexanone, which two trials would I use? Take a minute and look at the data and decide which ones you would use to find the order with respect to HCl and with respect to cyclohexanone. We want here something that's constant. One stays constant while we double the other. So if I want to know the order with respect to HCl, I would probably compare these first two trials because HCl is changing, but the cyclohexanone is staying the same. And if I want to know the order with respect to cyclohexanone, I'm going to look at the first trial and the third trial because their cyclohexanone is changing, but HCl is staying the same. Once I've done these experiments, I'll be able to tell what the order is with respect to cyclohexanone and acid. And I'm going to show you some equations here where we are solving for these exponents. Um, as a reminder, we get y, the order with respect to I3 minus, from our graph by looking at it graphically because we can measure that one directly. For cyclohexanone and acid, we're doing the different trials. And essentially, this is an equation that we would use to find the order with respect to cyclohexanone and with respect to acid. These equations are not different from what you've seen in Chem 106, but um, they are just written out so that you can uh, see the whole equation. Basically, you compare the rates and the concentrations that you changed, and that's going to give you your exponent there. In this case, because we'll have real data, it may be that you don't come out with a whole number for your order of the reaction. Most of the examples you've seen in Chem 106 probably are whole numbers like 1 or 2, and in this case, um, the number may be something different like 1.13 or 0.77, and so you're just going to round it to the nearest whole number when you state what the order is. And once we know the orders with respect to each reactant, we can take any of our trials and we can plug in our concentrations and the rate that we measured and we can actually calculate our rate constant for this reaction. And you will do that as well. In the pre-lab, you should have written out hypothetical rate laws for uh, this reaction mechanism, assuming that different steps were the rate limiting step. And of course, we know that the experimentally determined rate law should match the rate law for the rate limiting step. And so we're going to compare our experimental data to those hypothetical rate laws that you wrote during the pre-lab. And doing that, we'll be able to tell which step is the rate limiting step, hopefully. And we'll also be able to justify that with our experimental data. Because you're going to be collecting class data for this experiment, we want you to do a Q test, which is a statistical test to identify outliers, and it only works for extreme values. 
um, those that are too high or too low or on the edges of the data. And you are going to need to be able to calculate this on the exam. So you'll want to pay attention to how we do it here. Uh, if the data are precise, that is repeatable, no points will be excluded. But if they're imprecise, then we may need to exclude an outlier. And the way we do it is we compare our calculated value for Q with a table of uh, critical values and decide if the point can be excluded. Our experimental value is just the distance to the nearest neighbor divided by the range, and it's the absolute value of that. So um, I'll show you an example here. In this case, um, these are already sorted so that they go in numerical order. Make sure when you have your class data that you sort it before you do anything else. Then we're going to look at the highest and lowest values. So we're going to compare this one and we're going to compare this one. And what we do is we simply subtract these two, like 0.00342 minus 0.00359. And then we're going to divide by the range 0.00342 minus 0.00384. And we're going to look at our value. In this case, we get 0 0.405. And we have 15 data points, so we'll come over here to 15. And we'll look across to our 90% confidence level, which is 0.338. And if our 0.338 is our critical value and the value we calculated, our experimental value is 0.405, and it's greater than the critical value that we find in the table, then we should exclude that point. So this point, this first point, we're not going to include it when we go on to calculate the average for these points. We'll only include the ones that are not outliers. In lab today, it's important that you follow the safety rules. We will ask you to wear gloves, goggles, a lab coat, and have no exposed skin below your waist. Cyclohexanone that you're um, working with is flammable, and it's also harmful if ingested, inhaled, or absorbed through the skin. Um, you only should remove the small quantity that you need for the experiment from the hood. Otherwise, it should stay in the hood. You should be careful with those solutions. Hydrochloric acid is corrosive, and the triiodide solution is an irritant, and it also will stain skin, clothing, and surfaces. So be careful about that. I'll also note that exam one is coming soon. Check the learning suite for announcements. It will happen after you complete experiment four. That's everything for today. Thanks for listening and good luck in lab.